Hey guys, Pete Bagwell again. Uh, I knew all about what I wanted to say until last night. I was doing research, I was compiling facts, everything. I was asking people at work their opinions on different things. And uh, then last night I was having some cookie dough. And uh, God just kind of pulled my attention from where I was really, really looking forward to jumping on to some place where uh, I still kind of know, still learn a little bit about it. But uh, just, I really just want to expound a little bit more on who God really is. Because there is a whole lot of misconceptions about Him. And I am not going to come near covering all of them. But I think it would be good if we covered some of the big ones. <laughs> like how God's just looking for an excuse to smite people. Come on. That is not the God of the New Testament. That's where in the Gospels do you see Jesus doing that? It's Jesus put the smack down on, on the religious people more than anything. And uh, God's wanting to do, he's wanting to shake some sense into them. It's a lot easier to be kind and nurturing to people that just don't know him, just have an innocent heart, just got burned by people. And then they project that onto God. Man, every every person I work with on a regular basis has some horror story about a church person, about a super Christian, and that's that's what they attribute. That's that's why they don't go to church. That's why that's why they don't know God. And that's it's not right. There's a lot, a lot of good people that just don't give God a second chance because somebody screwed up the first time. And uh, that's, that's really where my heart's at, is just trying to rebuild that bridge. Because somebody, somebody that actually meets God, you don't, you don't forget about it. You don't ignore him. You don't really even deny him. <laughs> and God's not afraid of questions. He's got big shoulders. Bring it on, whatever. If a question is what it takes to get you to start a conversation with God, why would he be so angry about it? Man, I remember when, uh, even after I moved here to Tulsa, when I was supposed to be super holy I was still just an emotional train wreck and uh, I was just I would just write because that's that's how I collected my thoughts and I would write and I would write I just put headphones on and just go to town I've got pages and pages I ended up having to uh, I ended up typing it all out so I can just look it up on my computer or on my phone or wherever for quick reference I've been I've been reading a lot of that stuff lately, just for milestones, to see how far I've come, like little progress reports, you know, over the last seven, eight years. And uh, there, was, <laughs> there was one time, I was having an awful time at work, I was just, you know, I, just, just an awful time. Just a bunch of things, it's just bad. And, uh, so I went home and just went off on God. It was some of the most colorful language you would ever hear. But I just wrote it all out, man. I was furious, but it was in my head and putting it on paper was how I got it out. <laughs> I just I was like a little kid throwing a temper tantrum. You know, like those kind you see when you're shopping and then the kid just drops on the floor and he turns into dead weight and he starts shrieking and then the whole store is just embarrassed for the mom. 
<laughs> just like that. And all God did, the tears streaming down my face, I was so angry. All God did, man, he was just, it was like he just gave me a big hug. Like in Goodwill Hunting at the end, you know, it's the, uh, the star has all these issues and he's meeting up with this counselor, therapist, something. And then, uh, I hate to ruin it for you, but I already started. Then at the end, the, uh, the counselor finally, finally hones in on this, uh, this main actor's issues. And he just gives this main actor just a big hug. He said, man, it's okay. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's okay. And then the, the main actor just starts going through like all seven stages of grief and denial all at once. He starts getting violent. And then finally he just breaks down. And uh, that's, that's, that's about what happened between me and God. It was just, man, when you just feel, when you get enveloped completely by love, you don't walk away the same. I still had temper tantrums. I still might have a couple now and again but uh god's bigger than that he's bigger than that and he's not he doesn't get in a hurry he invented time he just he's kind of like a uh snuffleupagus i forget where that's from fraggle rock or sesame street or something just happy easy going Slow, just enjoys everything. <laughs> God doesn't get in a hurry. Man, I could have been a whole lot more grown up five years ago than I am right now. But God's working with me where I'm at. He's working with everybody where they're at, but some people aren't really vying for progress. And that might be evident in prayer lines. If you see them every week I heard that uh, when I was still still like a sponge when I first got here just learning everything absorbing everything and then uh, and then I had to turn a filter on and kind of work through some of that crap but when I first came here I was just listening to everybody because everybody seemed to have so much knowledge and uh, and this one chick was like you know you know how you can gauge a person's real relationship with God I said, well, no, how? If they're the same in five years that they are today. Same in a year, same in two years. And, and there's some things that don't turn on a dime. I have had a, uh, a pretty cynical, kind of caustic outlook on some things that God has been chipping away at for a while. But there's some things, too, that have just fallen off. God knows where you're at, and he's not pushing you. If you feel pressured, man, it's either somebody in the church, it's the devil telling you you're not doing good enough, or it's just your own insecurities that the devil's using to manipulate your emotions. Yeah. And there's been so much that God has walked me through. I've thrown so many temper tantrums with God. <laughs> he's, he's got nothing but encouraging things to say afterwards. Man, I'll just be sitting there pounding, just waiting for you know a spanking, a mean, harsh word, whatever. And God's just like, hey, you know, that's cool. I still love you. Here's how we can fix this, and here's what your problem is. <laughs> and it's easy for love to just get straight to the point. God doesn't really pull punches that much. I was looking through, uh, there, was, there was three distinct conversations I had with God last year, summer of last year. And a lot of them, it was just God spelling out my issues for me. <laughs> and one of them, he was like, you know why you can't see all this stuff? I said, no, because you got your blinders on. You know why you didn't have your blinders on? <laughs> no, because you were born with them. Ouch. But 
there's there's a lot of things I think that we as people just grow with that aren't that aren't supposed to be a part of us as Christians we're supposed to be love unbiased impartial love we're supposed to be the just a completely transparent image of God another one of those conversations God told me don't I say it, don't let anybody accuse you of not being my representative of not being a, a transparent representative for me or something like that and for me that's a uh, that's a tall order I like sizing people up when I first meet them and then uh, and then deciding how close I want to get to them. And ultimately, that's just playing favorites. It's not what God does. If somebody's going to stab me in the back. They're going to do it either way. May as well. well. What God told me was, may as well just let him do it so I can grow up from it. If I'm still doing what God told me to do. Really, over the last year and a half, two years especially, God's been taking off every single excuse I have for thinking that people suck. For, you know, I don't want to get close to this person because they have this insecurity and that just grates on me. Or, you know, I don't want to have to bother talking to that person because they're just vain and arrogant and I get tired of listening to them talk about themselves. And, you know, it's ultimately, who cares? Anywhere in the Gospels, you look, you don't see Jesus playing favorites. Nowhere. You don't see him denying anybody. Really. So what's our excuse? He's the example. How, how are we supposed to be any different? No. Nah. Back to the whole God not being afraid of questions thing. There was, uh, there was this girl that I worked with, she was moving to Arizona. And then this, uh, this other guy, he was, uh, he's, he's into some weird stuff. Like, uh, I never bothered sitting around and listening to the details, but I guess the gist of it is, uh, it's like a real rough form of Christianity, but, uh, it's, it's like an environmentalist kind. So basically I guess Captain Planet is Jesus or they're the same person. One of the guy. And, uh, so this dude got wind of this chick moving and, uh, and he was like, Hey, you know, you, we, we should sit down and have some coffee sometime. And then this girl's just really friendly. So she was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. And she's a coffee junkie. So, you know, I'm not going to turn that down. And, uh, I guess they sat there for like three hours and she just listened and listened and listened and listened and listened <laughs> walked away the exact same <laughs> so I heard about that and then uh, a day or two later I was talking to her at work and I was like hey since you listened to this guy for a few hours you mind uh, give me a little bit of your time so I can set some other things straight and she was like okay yeah that's cool so we just picked a day we were both getting off of work at the same time and we just just there was a cafe right there we just went and hung out for like three or four hours and she started like well first I started explaining kind of where I'm at and then she started asking questions like like how how does faith work I'm more of a I'm like a I'm a science person I like knowing how things work and job I don't know who taught her, but she, she, she had it in her head that faith and science have nothing to do with each other. And that's BS. If God created everything, then wouldn't everything eventually, at one point or another, if you break everything down, there, God is in there somewhere. Romans 1 talks about it. You know, the invisible attributes of God, you can clearly see them everywhere you go. So that, that was one epiphany for her. You know, 
fun science. All it's going to do is prove us right. Is that <laughs> what's the matter with that? Let's go. I'm all for research. All it's going to do is just. It, People that don't believe in God are going to have less to stand on. Let's say it that way. Then another one of her sticking points was that she had all these questions and she had nobody to ask. She got burned by church people and didn't want anything to do with stepping inside one of those buildings again, especially one with the cross. And uh, <laughs> I'll never forget the look on her face when I just told her that God's not afraid of questions. Man, if, if my questions don't lead to the answers that have God in them, <laughs> what am I believing? Is that... Is there... If you want truth to your, for your questions, God's in there somewhere. So what is there to be afraid of? What's God got to hide? Or what's your pastor got to hide? There's absolutely nothing wrong with critical thinking inside the church. God never wanted anybody to shut off their mind as soon as they walk into the foyer, go sit down in a pew, or whatever. Nobody's supposed to disengage their brain. But... A lot of people do. And uh, one thing God's been working with me on is just uh, having a perspective of His kind of love. And that's not something I'm real good at. I just kind of assess. I'm the kind of person that just assesses everything, good or bad. And uh, I do that with people. And that, uh, that preemptively really breaks up and disrupts a lot of potential relationships where I could be a vessel for God. And that's nobody's fault but my own. I wish I had an excuse. <laughs> but that's what I get for talking to God, I guess. No excuses. <sighs> but ultimately what it boils down to it's just you and I being the best avenue that we can be to reach everybody else. It's not about that prosperity gospel crap where I just throw my money in a bucket and then God's going to dump blessings all over me and I can swim in dollar bills in a big Olympic-sized pool. That's garbage. I can tell you all the places where it is in the Bible, but <laughs> you wouldn't really find it yourself. <laughs> hmm. And, uh, yeah, it really just boils down to God wanting a real relationship with you, with me, with, with everybody. That's, that's our job as Christians, is to keep adopting people. We're supposed to evangelize the love of God, not evangelize for the sake of getting another notch on our belt. If it's if it boils down to performance, then it's time to reevaluate what's important to us, our priorities. So there ain't nothing wrong with just going to God and pouring out whatever's in your heart. That's the best way to get that poison out. Whether it's anger, fear, whether you got molested when you were little, man, there I had no idea until I moved down to the middle of the country, just how prevalent molestation is, especially among young girls. It is awful. Now, after just, I don't know if I'm just around them or if God is helping me just kind of break down people's personality so I know best how to witness to them. Now, he doesn't do that with everybody. Just, just the people he knows I'm not going to hurt or disavow or avoid or be a poor representative of him for. But there's a lot of people I work with, man, you can see that kind of hurt in their eyes. 
And it's it's not right. There's nothing wrong with having to face that with God. He's going to be right there to do it with you. He's going to be the one right there with his arm around you. Regardless of whether you're married, dating, single, lonely, whatever. It's going to be God that's right there in there with you. He's going to be the one shoveling that crap out with you. Right out of your heart. And that's, that's, that's where a lot of people just don't do anything. They don't think they can. People think they're supposed to approach God with, with a set of, of procedures because that's what they saw other people do in church, whether they got to wear some ugly, dumb-looking robe or like four layers of suit or whatever. It doesn't matter. I remember when I first came down here and started going to Dave Roberson's church, I came just like this, jeans, t-shirt, backwards hat. Sometimes I wore a do-rag. And I heard about this one older lady, a little more traditional. She, uh, she got all uppity, up in arms, about me wearing a hat in church. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> so I'm only supposed to spend time with God in church. I got to dress up to go to church. What if I spend time with God when I'm in the shower? Then what? What's the excuse? Am I going to dress up, take a shower? <laughs> really? Who thinks of this stuff? <laughs> Man, again, Paul said, dude, if it's a sin to you, don't do it. But we have freedom in Jesus. Man, we become a Christian, God looks at us, he sees Jesus. He's, he's like our coat. He's our covering. He's our intercessor. He's, he's the one plowing the way for all of us. I just get really, really aggravated when I see real life stories of of how religion has kept people from God. And uh, I'm one of those toggle switch kind of people. I don't really have smooth transitions. It's either on or off or yes or no. And uh, <laughs> it's a lot of times when I'm at work, I just stay quiet about God because uh, I, would, would, I would not shut up. There's so much I want to tell those people. I would just overload everybody around. And I tried that with my church friends, and that didn't go over so well either. Ended up, uh, <laughs> when I first got filled with the Spirit, and uh, I, was, I was 18, and uh, I've been going to church for a couple years, actually, at that point. Got real involved, because service was how you got closer to God. Still is, right? No? Not so much? But, uh, man, I got really close with some of those people in the couple of years I've been going to church. And they, a lot of them had never quite strayed as far as I had from church or from God. And, uh, and what I wanted ultimately was God, just <laughs> not church. So I ended up coming back around anyway and getting involved in church and then getting burned again all the same. But by then, I had had enough of the foundation of God himself in my life that uh, all it did was push me away from people and not from God. And, uh, yeah, first got spirit-filled, man. I was so ignorant and so enthusiastic about everything that had to do with the Holy Spirit and this this new epiphany of who Jesus of who Jesus was and what He really did for us and 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 how God sees us, I was so excited, and uh, <laughs> I took every single one of my church friends and I just talked their ear off about it. Nothing changed. Well, with them, we <laughs> we quit being friends. <laughs> that changed. <laughs> Some of them, some of them, God has uh, has brought back around. But we're uh, 
we don't talk too much about religious stuff. One of them is actually a, uh, he's my video game buddy. We, uh, there's this game that came out a couple months ago. We logged about 18 or 20 hours into it the day of release. So we have fun. We just kind of watch our boundaries. And I went to a, uh, I graduated from a little Christian school. One of my really good friends there, he'd been going for uh, four years. He's a couple years older than me. He was he never became a Christian. Yeah, he was, went to a Christian school, he was around all these Christian people, saw all of their ins and outs and a lot of their flaws. And uh he was just one of those one of those people that's just a good person, you know. There's a there's some people at work that are just friendly and they're a whole lot nicer than I am but they don't have God <laughs> so I got a ways to go but anyway this guy he was one of those man he was one of those guys that just he got along with everybody and he was always friendly never had anything bad to say about anybody and uh, graduated wasn't a Christian started dating this chick and uh, started getting kind of plugged in with this this youth pastor that, that revamped the entire youth program at that church I was going to in Washington. And uh, eventually, one day, he was, he was hanging out with this girlfriend that was one of those good church people, you know, kind of with a good heart. And uh, they were just chatting, and he was like, you know, I think I'm going to be a Christian today. I'm going to go for it. Let's do it. So it's like 1030 at night. They ended up calling this youth pastor. <laughs> and he wasn't going to turn him down, man. This youth pastor had been waiting for it for years. So 1030 or 11, man, they just, uh, this dude and his girlfriend went over to the youth pastor's house and prayed the prayer and had a little miniature party. And the youth pastor <laughs> went back to bed. And I thought he still acted the same. <laughs> he didn't have much of a Christian model to attain to. A bunch of things that were taught at those at a lot of churches where I grew up and that school was just just act right, just be a good person. After you get saved, then you're good. When really that's you know if you want to get by with the bare minimum, cool, go for that. But man, God has so much more to offer than that. So much more. But a lot of people don't like getting over themselves enough to realize everything that he wants to do for us. I mean, yeah, that prosperity gospel, it's true in the sense that God wants to bless us. Man, he wants to just dump however many zeros before, after a one or a nine or whatever, just exponential amounts of money, astronomical. But you know what he thinks is more important? A person's soul. So a person's soul is more important than a billion dollars, a hundred billion, a trillion. We have a ways to go. I've been listening to, uh, to, regrettably, to some televangelists doing the uh, this radical grace thing where you don't have to be accountable to God. You just got to pray the prayer, confess with the heart, now believe with the heart, and then you're good to go. Man, you got your fire insurance, all bills paid. Go ahead and poke that prostitute. It's cool. No, that's <laughs> that's a crappy relationship with God, if it's even one at all. You start believing in that stuff, man, you, at some point, there has to be a little searing of the conscience there, and God's not about that. God's about higher standards, not lower standards. 
<laughs> I, was, I was watching this one televangelist. Sometimes I just like to watch him just so I can feel better about the video stuff that I was doing for a while. <laughs> but they're on TV, so, you know, what can I say? But there's this one guy, he had like, uh, he was in this weird fake studio, and you could tell that uh, I think it was a really poor green screen in the background. And uh, it was like a picture of the tropics. There was, there was this little island, and you could see the the waves behind him and a pine tree or <laughs> a palm tree that knew it started with a P. <laughs> but none of the waves were moving, you know, it was just one of those it was it's like a school picture, except this dude's talking. And he was talking about wisdom and and he was talking to the camera and he was very intent. He was talking about like his fourth key or something and then the camera moved over here and he was still talking to this one. And then he finally started looking over here. <laughs> it's like, really? That's, that's the best we can do as Christians. <laughs> Man, we got God on our side and we're putting out crap like this. <laughs> we got a ways to go. Anyway, God dumping abundant blessings on his people. If you give a hundred dollars, you know, whatever. That's not how it works at all, man. It's about where your heart is with God. It's not like you're going to hide anything from him. So you may as well get it all out there anyway. But if you're going to be a selfish tightwad tool with your money, which God has no problem replacing, and you're not going to be God's representative for your neighbor that God cannot replace, men, it's time for a reevaluation. There's a lot of things God wants to do for us, but we just put ourselves in the way between me and him. He was having a little come to Jesus chat with me one time because I was, uh, I'd, my mind had been under attack. Like we had just got in this house and, uh, I want to say it was within a few months. It could have been a year. I really don't know. But uh, I had this brilliant idea about quitting my job and getting into the ministry. But there was something about it, man. There was just something in the back of my mind I couldn't shake. Like it's something, something that that I knew was going to happen eventually. So God had told me it was going to happen eventually. And so I kept hearing this in my head, and I, I started running with it, but there was still that, that little nagging in the back of my mind that it was, it was like a sliver, you know, something that's just not right. And uh, I ended up talking to like a half dozen people that I trusted, that I know can hear from God and will shoot straight with me, that don't care as much about my emotions. And that's an important thing to have in somebody you respect as a mentor. And uh, turns out, long story short, didn't quit my job, still got it in the ministry anyway, because ministry is where you're at in life. It's your perspective. It's not whether or not you are paid by people to go around running off at the mouth. Man, I'm a minister at my job, and they pay me to do it. What a deal. But... God was talking to me. Well, it turns out that was the uh, that was the devil. Anyway, if you hadn't guessed, trying to get me to step out way before my time. And uh, it was God was talking to me when I was struggling with that, with the whole quitting my job thing and all this financial stuff. Because I had to, I was holding the grudge against God for some other issues that I had brought on myself. Stupid. And God just told me, you know, <laughs> I'd love to be your safety net, <laughs> but you got all these safety nets that you put up that are in the way. And then I had uh, the the picture that was painted in my mind was uh, it was like a circus. You know, I got all these uh, these people doing way up high acrobatics and everything, 
and uh, way down towards the ground, they got the safety net. That's where God is. You ain't going to die, but you're probably going to feel like it on the way down. <laughs> but, and then it's like I had all these other safety nets just that I put up that had nothing to do with God that were all the way up to the top of the circus tent. So instead of walking a tightrope, man, I could have just been army crawling on those safety nets. would have been just as high. I wouldn't have fallen anywhere. And that was, that was when God told me that that's, man, those times when you really, really put yourself out there for him, there's nothing like those times. Not for him, not for me, not for you. Those are the times when, uh, when that bridge between you and God really, really gets reinforced. So I still got uh, a few of those safety nets out, but there's uh, a lot of good things that have been happening. My wife Carrie, and, uh, you know, just future disclaimer, makes me feel like a grown up when I call her my wife. So I'm just gonna say it once at the beginning when I mention her, and then just call her Carrie. So if you want to think I'm living in sin, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. Carrie, um, she's getting her master's degree right now. And then her car was acting up, and right around that time, some one of our friends was having some issues with their car. And, uh, and I talked to her, and the issue was going to be a couple hundred bucks. You know, that's that's what fun money is for. So I talked to Carrie, and I was like, "Hey, is it cool if uh, if we spot this person a little bit of extra money so they can get their car fixed, so they can get to their job, so they can further their life?" And she's like, yeah, okay, that, that's cool. And uh, then, like, maybe two weeks later, something just freaked out in her car. I don't even remember what it was, a fuel pump or alternator or whatever. Long story short, that ended up being about four fifty, five hundred bucks. And then we had Carrie's tuition coming up. And that was due, like, within a month. And then, out of the blue, Carrie gets this email from her college saying, oh, hey, we, uh, we see you're doing a good job, so here's a $500 scholarship. Coincidence? Maybe. Probably not, though. Man, God likes just coming through, and as sad as it sounds, he likes proving that he's real. His heart is for us to succeed, but a lot of times his definition of success and ours are a little different. We don't need a pool in our backyard. We don't need a 50,000 square foot mansion on a 5,000 acre lot. Does that bring glory to God or does it inspire jealousy among other people to try and inspire them to do the same thing? coax people out of their money, man, what's wrong with having a 2,000 square foot house in the middle of the burbs with the soccer moms and whoever else and just funneling that money towards an awareness of God one way or the other? Nothing. Where's your priorities at? Do you need an Olympic-sized indoor swimming pool in your living room so you can show it off to all the other tele televangelists? You don't really need it, but it's the blessing of God that you extorted out of church people because they didn't know better. Not you. I'm sorry. I get a little worked up. But it uh, seems like a lot of times Christians just have lower standards. And we should if we're trying to do it on our own power. You know, at least the world's teamed up with the devil so they can funnel money wherever. <laughs> but, but we're over here like, God bless this little bake sale that we're doing. And, you know, yeah, sure. But don't let your cookies taste like crap just because you're doing it for a church. Man, whatever you're doing, do it with all your heart like you're doing it for God himself. 
not not some subpar production where you can squeeze by just because you're using the label of Christianity like a lot of music a lot of worship music sells just because it's all emotionally amped up but you look at the substance of it and it's crap you know, for, <laughs> where is God in, in it and there's some good stuff you know don't get me wrong but uh, I don't really listen to it I like a lot of Christian indie artists that can give some of their personal flair and let God shine through and it doesn't have to be preachy so then it's cool to share with non-Christian friends because it's good music I really like uh, Future of Forestry I think the last couple albums got a little weird but uh, but they got some good ones they're some of my favorites right now and uh, man God would rather withhold from us than let us just go into self-destruct mode. A little fuzzy thing floating around. But God values our relationships with Him more than anything else. Man, you think when I was off just being an anti-Christian turd that God didn't want fellowship with me as bad as he wanted it with the preacher that I'm sitting that I'm sitting under now, Dave Roberson, Gary Carpenter, whoever else. No, man, it's, he's got open arms for everybody, and there is a lot of people with <laughs> all kinds of emotional dysfunctions. Don't believe me? Watch some reality TV. Don't believe me? Then study the people that watch reality TV. <laughs> it's depressing. <laughs> And uh, I remember, man, I had this, uh, I was still basing it on works. One of my really, really, really good friends ended up, he was really, really trying to get his life together. Started getting real involved in church, all these ministries, started going to school, he graduated, with a, he graduated from a welding school. And uh, he was trying to get his estranged family back together and just really giving it the gung ho, just the A plus effort. The welding place that he worked at shut down. And they're like, hey, if, uh, if you still want to work with us, uh, we're going to Mexico. And the dude's like, well, I'm here for this church, man. I ain't going nowhere. So <laughs> he didn't go anywhere. But I don't know. If that broke him or what, he just kind of started getting really discouraged. Ended up hanging himself. That was devastating. And then me, because I knew how to do video stuff, I offered to do the memorial. And uh, so what the church did was they just got a bunch of his friends together, just had him fill out this little schedule sheet and uh, Everybody came to the church and, and gave a little snippet about their favorite memories of this guy. And, and then I got, I got these DVDs of all the, the rough clips to put together to send to, to this guy's mom, to this guy's kids, to whoever. I was sitting there doing the video. Man, I couldn't do more than five or ten minutes without having to take a break and just bawl. It was awful. That was just heavy. But when I first heard about it, my thought was, well, it, how, if he killed himself, how can he go to heaven? It's, that, that's not right. And then, <laughs> and then God pointed out how stupid I was being. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's an emotional issue. Man, he believed in me, but he lost that battle with his emotions. He just caved, he buckled. He didn't believe he could take it anymore. So, in a sense, he just abandoned ship. Doesn't matter how strong emotions are. They're not a part of our spirit if we are born again. If Jesus lives in here, things can change. 
So I think that's about all I got. Man, if you're if you're a talker, you should go for a walk around the neighborhood or something and just pour yourself out to God. I did that when I was in uh, I was living in this other little just in a middle class neighborhood. And I would just go out in the evening, just walk around for an hour or two, just circling the neighborhood and just just praying in tongues under my breath and just having a chat with God in my mind. And man, that was that was some good times. And then there was one time uh, somebody called the cops on me because they thought I was casing the neighborhood. <laughs> that was a that was a weird conversation with the police officer, but uh, you know, it was, I ended up moving out of that neighborhood a little later. <laughs> but if you're talking, man, God wants your issues, so. Quit keeping the issues from him. He sees that. He loves you and he wants, he would love a chance to prove it. And he will. You put yourself out there, man, for him. He'll come through in ways you didn't think was ever possible, no matter how long you've been going to church. So, all that being said, I love you guys, and uh, and I love this opportunity. Man, I had been in incubation for about two years too long. God told me to start a Bible study, and no, I, I uh, kept telling me, I just kept putting it off, and I kept building myself up and not really going anywhere with it. So I was turning into like a spiritual pressure cooker. So having these opportunities to just run off the mouth and just say whatever's on my heart, man. And it's true to the best that I know of. My prayer and my hope is that whatever I'm saying, man, it's in the Bible. I like to be a little, uh, elusive with the passages because you know, if you're looking for them yourself, maybe you'll find God in there. But they're in there. My prayer is that what I'm saying, man, it just finds a place in your heart. And God's able to plug that in and just talk with you through it until you're confident and able enough to just stand on your own. And then it's you and God. And then you can do the same thing I'm doing. Well, maybe not, you know, I'm in online, but just with people around you, within your sphere of influence. Man, you, you let God put you on his shoulders, people are just going to come to you. Like Smith Wigglesworth in, uh, in some train, he was just chilling in the back of the train, just reading a book or you know, whatever, praying, minding his own business, which a lot of Christians don't do. And, you know, just doing... What people do is chilling, and uh, somebody came up to me. He's like, "Hey, man, you uh, you convict me of sin. I don't know what it is about you, but you got something, and uh, I'm feeling awful around you. How do we fix this? You know, that's not how they talked in the what 150 years ago or however long, but you get the gist of it. That's." That's what God's bringing us towards, being able to draw people in without having to even open our mouths if we don't need to. Or until, right? We can keep our mouths shut until we need to open them. Yeah. So, thanks again. And uh, appreciate all the, all the love. Till next week.